Well, my name is Todd Schreiner. If you don't know me, I'm the pastor of care here at our church. And this morning, um, we are starting a new series uh, for a sermon series every Sunday on the book of Psalms. Uh, Boy, there's such richness in the book of Psalms, in the Bible of the Old Testament. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the first chapter uh, of Psalms? It's, if you open your Bible in the middle, you probably will hit Psalms and then go to the very first chapter. We're going to kick off this series starting with Psalms chapter 1. Now, the book of Psalms is a, a really a, a genre or type of literature that's artistic and poet, poetic or lyrical in nature. It, it's a book filled with songs and prayers that are offered to God by God's people. Some of the most notable authors of Psalms is David, the, the king of Israel, and then his son, Solomon, who also wrote some of the Psalms. There's even a prayer of Moses in Psalm 90. And then there's other authors of the 150 Psalms we have in the Bible, all inspired by God. Now, the Psalms show a range of emotions. They show exploding praise to God and then frustration and grief and lament to God. The Psalms were written in a way so you would remember them and be able to recite them. Uh, They use images and, and symbols and figures of speech and emotive vocabulary to help you remember them, like a song. You know, music is a gift from God. I'm so grateful that every Sunday that we have the gift of music to help us encounter the living God, to see Jesus through music. Has a song ever moved you in such a way that you were like, oh, I I, I feel touched? I know I have. Music does that. Again, it's a gift from God. And the Psalms, the book of Psalms can do that as well. They're written, especially in the original language of Hebrew, to move our emotions to adore God and then remember his truth. We sometimes miss that uh, in reading the English translation. However, I, I remember many verses in Psalms as I have followed Jesus that have echoed my heart's cry to adore and to worship God and remember his truth. I, I think of Psalm 23. Some of you may know that psalm. It's a common psalm, psalm that is, is read many times where remember that it says in Psalm 23, uh, though, you know, um, <laughs> Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for God is with me. I, I think it's Psalm 27, where it says, One thing I ask of the Lord, that I will seek, that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and to gaze upon his beauty. I think of Psalm 34, where it says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And then it, it goes on in that psalm. It says that God is near or close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are a crushed in spirit. I think of Psalm 46. Oh, Psalm 46, such a good thing where it says, God is my refuge and my strength. He's ever present in times of trouble. And then the end of that Psalm, it says, be still and know that I am the Lord. I I think of Psalm 51. I love that Psalm. I used to sing this as a song when I was in college uh, as a new believer. And it says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I think of Psalm 139. Oh, such a great psalm of remembering of how God values us, how he loves us. It says in Psalm 139 that he has knit us together in our mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And then at the end of that psalm, there's a prayer of kind of examining our heart. It says, oh, search me, O God, and know me. Test me. Know, know, see if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. There's such richness and depth in the book of Psalms. And all of these words in Psalms echo a heart cry to God for our need for God, to show that we try to know God more intimately. So let's look at the first chapter of Psalm, Psalm chapter one. And would you follow along with me as I read verses one through six, Psalm one. 
Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Verse five, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. We see here, there are two types of people, the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. We learn in our last series that we had here on Sunday, which was, you know, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount recorded in the book of Matthew. There's two paths that Jesus talks about. There's the path that is wide, that leads to destruction, and many will find it. And then there's the path that is narrow, that leads to life, life with God, and very few find it. Well, Jesus goes on in his sermon in Matthew 7, where it says there's two foundations that you can build your life upon. You can build your life upon the rock, which is Jesus, that leads to life. Or you can build your life upon the sand, which is just on self, not God, and leads to destruction. So this is a common theme in God's word to teach us there's two options, and we have a choice. Choose life with God that leads to blessing or life apart from God that leads to destruction. So as we begin in Psalm 1, let me pray for us and ask God to speak to us through his word. Let's pray. Oh God, I do thank you for your word that brings instruction. Now help us to understand your word and to take heed of what you are saying and to help us to know more about you, all of who you are, so that we may live for you. I pray as the psalmist wrote in Psalm 19, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We'll look now back to verse one of Psalm chapter one. In verse one, we read the word blessed. Blessed is the man now, I'm curious about this first word. What does blessed actually mean? You can go to a dictionary and find a definition, but I think there's a better way to discover meanings of words we find in the Bible, and that is to use the Bible to help us to understand how the word is being used in the scriptures. So, if you do a little study on the book of Psalms, and you find, try to find that word blessed, you would find out that that word blessed is used 26 times in the book of Psalms. And then if you do a, a brief survey of some of those verses that include the word blessed in Psalms, you would discover more of what that word is trying to convey. This is kind of a helping you to do simple Bible study. So let's look at a few of those verses in the book of Psalms. Look at Psalm 32. Verses one through two, it says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. So here, blessed is a state of being, of knowing your sins are forgiven. Your sins are covered. It's knowing you're right with the Lord because of the mercy of God, which brings joy and blessedness. Look at Psalm 34. Psalm 34, I, I mentioned this earlier. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And then it goes on. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Blessed is the one who is, takes refuge in God, who trusts the Lord and are content and secure in God because he is their refuge. Look at Psalm 65. Verse four, it says, blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. So here we read, blessed is the one who is 
near to God, dwells with God, who is satisfied in the goodness of God. So, okay, so from this little brief survey that we just did, we can understand blessed, blessed is the man, as we read here in in Psalm 1, to be one who is filled with joy because of the mercy of God. Their sins are forgiven. Their heart is full of God because they're satisfied with God. They're content with God because of his goodness. God is their refuge and savior. Do you see the blessed life of the one who is taking refuge in the Lord? God brings blessing, but not in material things. It's in him. It's in him alone. And all that he does for the believer, we can be fully satisfied, filled, fulfilled, and we, when we trust in the Lord our God. Blessed. So look again at verse one here. And, and now when you read, going on from blessed is the man, you now are gonna see what the Psalms are like as a type of literature, what it does. It creates a movement or a rhythm that emphasizes a point. So verse one again, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. There's a movement here that the psalmist is trying to portray. And I think it's a movement of sin. You know, a person could walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the way of sinners, and sit in the seat of scoffers. It states that the blessed person, though, however, does not participate in any three, any of these three statements in verse one. But the movement of this verse is showing a progression of downward sin. It's walking to standing to sitting, meaning you go from, you know, following some advice you heard from a worldly person or quote unquote, a religious person. And then Um, You go to then agreeing with or hanging out occasionally with people who do not follow God to then you're sitting, you're joining in, you're participating in with mockers and those who act cruel. You know, this gives an understanding that any and all of this kind of behavior is not the character of a blessed person, a person who is content in the Lord, has joy in the Lord, who delights in the law of the Lord, as verse two says, which we'll talk about more. We need to be careful where we spend our time and who we choose to spend our time with. Proverbs, the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. Proverbs chapter 12 says, the righteous person gives good advice to their friends, but the wicked will lead them astray. The temptation to sin and to do wrong is always before us. What are you doing to not give in to that temptation? Who are you spending your time with? Who are you listening to that could influence you not to see the goodness of God? Because there is so much that God wants to show you that we sometimes miss it when we are listening to other voices in our lives. God doesn't want us to give in to the worldly ways or its advice. We must not think that God's teaching and truth is not enough for our lives. God is enough. God's word is sufficient. Don't allow the wicked sinners and scoffers to influence and move you to agree and even participate in things that push you away from God. If you're a follower of Jesus today, I want to encourage you with these words in Ephesians chapter five of the New Testament of the Bible. It says, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you. Another translation says, don't even have a hint of those things in your life. We must be diligent in God's word and in prayer to strengthen us to keep Christ in the center of our lives. However, don't follow the truth of God, or some may think of them as the rules of God because we have to, or the preacher up on the stage told you to. But for the believer in Jesus, God's ways and plans are what brings satisfaction and wholeness to life, freedom and eternal joy in every circumstance that you go through in life. This is the blessed person So you follow and obey out of love for God, not out of obligation. Well, 
This leads to verse two. Look at verse two. The blessed person, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. So what is he, the blessed person, delighting in? Well, it says in verse two, the law of the Lord. Now, when you think about the law of the Lord, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? You may think about, oh, the Ten Commandments, right? That's what it's referring to, all these commandments and rules of God. But I would say that I believe the psalmist is thinking about something more broader than just the commandments of God. Now, the word law in the original language in the Old Testament, which is, you know, the original language is Hebrew, that word is Torah, which may sound familiar to some of you. This Hebrew word means instructions or directions. And when you think about instructions and directions that you get, there's also counsel and teaching and there's wisdom that probably goes with those instructions and also descriptions that coincide with such a word. So again, if we look at another chapter in the book of Psalms um, that uses this phrase, the law of the Lord, we could see a broader picture of the law of the Lord. Look at Psalm 19 with me starting in verse seven. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect. And he keeps going, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening in the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than, than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. So you can see here in Psalm 19, there is a broader understanding of the law of God than just the commandments of God. The law of the Lord is about the fullness of God than just simple rules. It's the testimony of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, which are perfect, true, making wise, right, pure, sure, enlightening, clean, and enduring, and so much more. And he goes on in Psalm 19, nothing compares, nothing can compare to this law of the Lord. This is what Psalm 1 is referring to when it states, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. This person is setting his affections on God. When God speaks, he's listening. Because he has the answer and the wisdom. Longing to encounter the true and living God that he reads from the law of the Lord that is revealed to him. Learning from his wisdom and ways. Now, a question that we could ask is, why didn't the psalmist just state the opposite of things that he listed in verse 1 to describe what the blessed person does? How his actions should be. You know, it, it could have, you know, a pseudo verse two could have sounded like this. Well, he doesn't do all this. He doesn't walk in the, you know, counsel of wicked nor stands in the way of sin. But he says it could say, oh, the blessed person walks with the godly. Well, he stands with the righteous and he sits with the gracious. However, it doesn't say that. Why? I think the reason why is because God wants our heart. Verse 2 here in Psalm 1 moves away from the physical actions to more of where the heart of the person lies. God doesn't just want our external good deeds. He wants our hearts to worship him, our hearts to be connected to God in devotion of all who he is. You know, Psalm 51 Again, I mentioned this earlier, but in this psalm also, it says, for you will not delight in sacrifice, O God, or I would give it to you. You, O God, would not be pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. That's what God is longing for. Your heart surrendered to him bowing your life before God in humble submission to him. Yes, God desires for us to do good deeds, but do not think that that is what God ultimately wants. He doesn't need our service 
to him as if we can give something that he doesn't already have. He has awful things. He holds all things together. However, he wants your heart. He wants all of your heart captivated by him and his truth filling your hearts and your minds that then motivates you to do the things that please him, to give glory to God. So I ask you this morning, where is your heart to God? Are you just doing the external things to be a good person in hopes to be right with God? Are you delighting and taking pleasure in the Lord? Is your heart connected with God, seeing his love and his mercy and his power and might that would draw you to worship Jesus this morning? When you read God's word, does it draw you? When you hear the gospel of Christ, that he died on the cross for your sins, rose from the dead, and now lives forever as the Redeemer, the one that brings forgiveness of all of our sins and gives us new life with God. Does, it, does that move you to surrender your life to Jesus as Lord? And when you pray, are you crying out to God, believing that he hears you? And when you worship, God, do you do it from a heart that wants to magnify God and see him lifted high because you know and believe that God's real. I know it. Now, I understand for believers at times, you may not always feel close to God, but that doesn't change the fact that God is with us, that he lives in us by the Holy Spirit is in control and holds all things together for his purposes to be accomplished through us as the scriptures state throughout the Bible. And James 4 says this, if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Part of drawing near to God is meditating on God's word as it states there in verse 2. This is not a meditation that you know, the, wor the world may try to tell you to do or some Eastern religion would say, oh, meditate and think on nothing, empty yourself. No, this is not what it's meaning here in meditating on God's law day and night. This is a focusing on God's truth and all of who God is digging in deep, studying the scriptures, memorizing, hiding the word of God in your heart as Psalm 19 states and allowing it to move you, change you, strengthen you. God's word is where we find help in life. Help to become God's people, what he desires us to be. This is where we can find peace and hope it's not an emptying yourself or thinking of some ethereal philosophy. It's your heart rendered to God that brings good and lasting fruit in your life that will please God, bring blessing from God, no matter what life brings your way. Look again, look at Psalm 1, look at verse 3 and 4. Here is... Again, as I explained earlier, this is the poetic and musical nature of Psalm where it uses word pictures and analogies to help us understand God's truth and his wisdom. Verse three, it says, he's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. So here we read, that the person who meditates on God and his word is a person who's like a tree planted by the streams of water that yield fruit. And the streams literally mean in Hebrew divisions of water, which most likely would refer to the favorite mode of irrigation in some ancient Middle East countries, canals that are dug in every direction to irrigate vegetation. The reason for these streams were to help to give growth and sustain life to plants. So I believe that the streams of water is referring to God's law as, we, as it, we read earlier in verse two. And as we discover God's law is not just the commandments, but all the instructions of the Lord, his ways, plans, promises, God himself. And this person who is like a tree planted by streams of water, which is intended for irrigation and growth, is not just, it just didn't 
That tree just didn't happen to appear or randomly grow by a stream. No, it says that it was planted. It was intentionally planted by the stream so that it would thrive and grow. See, this kind of person is moving closer, closer to the stream, God in his word, and digs in deep, meditates on it day and night to have the roots of his life getting fed from God's ways and instructions so that it may yield fruit, fruit that is good and useful for God's purpose. Fruit that comes in its proper season, as it's stated, in the timing and plan of God. You know, farmers learn to cultivate the land in the proper time and season for plants to yield the best fruit. So it is for those who plant themselves in the Lord Jesus, studying and trusting his word, his plan and timing for their lives to yield good fruit that God intends Such fruit comes as one matures and grows in the Lord. It takes time to bear fruit. Realize that. It takes time. It doesn't happen right away when you believe. It's in his season, as it states here. If you are going through a valley or hardship in your life, trust God. Dig in deep and keep God in the center of your life. Whatever you are going through, keep your eyes on Jesus. And if you are wondering, what's my purpose? What's my next step that I should take in life? I want to encourage you to remain faithful to God and his word. He will lead you as you remain faithful to him. Fruit will come, but in his timing. Take heed of the words of Jesus where he said this, and it's recorded in John chapter 15. He said, remain in me. And I in you, and you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. Well, Jesus goes on in that passage of scripture stating that if anyone does not abide in him, then that person is thrown away like a branch, withers, and then put into the fire and burned. There's only destruction and hopelessness for those who do not choose to trust Jesus and his way. Look again at Psalm 1, verse 3 and 4. Verse 3 and 4, they state that there are times where leaves can wither. The winds will come, but when we set our hearts on the Lord Jesus, our roots are deep in his word. We can stand through winds, storms, droughts of life. You know, there's a parallel passage in the Bible, a a, a related scripture that is stated in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17. And the prophet Jeremiah says this in verses 7 through 8 of Jeremiah 17. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, who trusts is, is, is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought. Why? For it does not cease to bear fruit. And the reason why is because he is grounded, rooted in the word of God. Where are your roots of your life? You know, Psalm 1 verse 4 says, the wicked or the unrighteous, those who trust in themselves will not last, especially in the storms and the droughts of life that will inevitably come. They will wither. They will be blown away, as verse 4 says. Their life is destined to perish, as it says there at the end of Psalm chapter 1, verse 6. In verse 5, it says, the wicked will not stand judgment, referring to the last days, or in other words, will be eternally condemned. This is not just a little temporary consequence, but an eternal destruction. Sin will bring devastating consequences. Yes, there may be some pleasures from not following God's ways, but take note, it's only temporary. Only temporary pleasures. It will not last. It usually leads, sin usually leads to hurt and to pain. And then ultimately, the Bible says, eternal destruction and condemnation. What God wants to give to his people and what he wants to give to you today is lasting hope, joy, 
and prosperity. This is about eternal hope and prosperity, not just for the here and now. So we read about the eternal condemnation of those who do not follow God, the wicked. But at the end of verse 3, it states that the one who does not take part in sin and delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on it will yield fruit and prosper. I believe the psalmist is talking about eternal prosperity, not just for the here and now prosperity. It's a pointer to what God will do one day for the believer in the Lord. Why do I believe this? It's because throughout the scriptures we read how believers go through hardships, go through struggles, go through tribulation. God uses all of that for his greater purpose and plan. We do not see in God's word Believers never having any problems. It's all perfect or rainbows and unicorns. No. Now, there are times of blessing that God gives to us in this life, but it doesn't compare to the eternal hope of heaven that we one day will have. So we see in another chapter of Psalms, let me, let me read this in Psalm 9, uh, 119. It says this in verses 71 and 72 and through 75. It says, it's good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. You hear that? It's good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than a thousand gold pieces, gold and silver pieces. I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. The psalmist writes, it's good for me that I was afflicted. Why? So that I might learn your ways, your precepts, O God. That I might know you more and realize I need you. God uses that. Look at in the New Testament, in Romans Romans 8, we have now the hope of the Messiah, Jesus, and what he brings. Listen in Romans 8, starting with verse 32, he says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he might also with him graciously give us all things? And then it says, who shall bring any charge to God's elect? And it talks, it's Jesus who died. Not only that, he rose from the dead. And then it goes on and brings a listing here. Who shall separate us? You know, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? And it is written, for your sake, We are being killed all day long and we are guarded as sheep to be slaughtered. That's from Psalm 44. Doesn't seem much prosperity for the believer there. But the Apostle Paul's response, he says, no. And all these things that he just listed were more than conquerors. Why? It's through Jesus, through him who loved us. God is here today and he loves you and wants you to be that more than a conqueror over all the circumstances, hardships, struggles that you go through in life. It will come. Where's your roots? Who are you trusting? If it's yourself, it will lead to destruction. The God of the Bible is in the business to give us all things which will be in eternal weight of glory, in everlasting life, in the presence of our God and King Jesus. This eternal hope and prosperity of the believer, it's in Jesus. This comes upon the blessed man who puts his roots down deep into God's word and God himself so that when you are tempted, you can go through hard times in life. You could overcome that temptation and have peace that comes from God. Now look at the last verse, verse six. And I want you to take heed of these words. Take it into heart. It says, verse six, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The Lord knows. Or another translation, it says, the Lord watches over the righteous. The righteous are those who follow God, trusting in God's mercy trusting in his provision to forgive their sins and to purify them, to give them righteousness. It's not about those who are religious or pure on their own. No one is righteous on their own. The Bible states we all sin. But for those who trust God's provision for forgiveness and righteousness through Jesus, they are his children. 
He knows them. He watches over them. Or can I say it this way? If you believe in Jesus, he knows you. He watches over you. He sees you. This is not the same for the wicked or those who turn away from God. They are left with themselves and in ourselves and down to our own efforts. We'll never pay the penalty of sin or able to do enough good to outweigh the bad. The wicked will perish. That's what it says there in verse six. So today, I encourage you, come and open your heart to the Lord. He's calling you. Trust and believe in Jesus. God has given his all for you. Would you not give your all to him? Your life to him. Surrender your heart to the one who made you so that you will not perish, but have everlasting life. Bearing fruit that will last, that brings wholeness and healing and strength. As I pray to close today, I want you to consider two choices. It's simple. Life with God or life apart from God. Pray in your heart and tell him. If you want life with God, tell him that you believe. Ask for forgiveness and surrender your life to him. God loves you. His plan is the best for your life. And I encourage you, if you are here and are a follower of Jesus, to now, I ask that you would pray as well and ask for God to strengthen you, to get your roots down deep. Dig deeper into God's word. Start studying it, memorizing it, committing it so that in the right timing and in the right season, you will bear the fruit that he wants you to be. And nothing compares, no gold or silver as the scripture says, no shiny thing could ever compare to knowing the Lord. It's far greater. So let's pray. Oh God, I pray that those here today that heard your word would take heed of it. And that those who may be thinking, I don't know if I follow or I don't know if I believe and I pray, oh God, that you would draw closer to them. Help them to see your goodness, your ways, your love for them and that they would surrender their life to you. Speak to their hearts. I pray for all those who are following you today, God, would you help them to dig in deep to your word, to be that blessed man that holds on to you and you alone, that digs their roots of their life deep into your word and all of who you are so that they may bear fruit, so that others around them would see all the goodness and the love and the mercy of God, how it is in them, and they too would be a witness for you to share that to others, and others would be drawn to you. God, use them. Help them to grow in you in a greater way. Oh, Father, we build our life upon you. We trust in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, Nordonia, and Medina, please go to our website at thechapel.life.